Are you looking for truth from God's Word that you can understand and apply to your life? You'll find it today on Make It Clear with Dr. Stan Pons, Bible teacher and president of Clarity Christian College, formerly known as Florida Bible College. Listen now as Stan makes it clear. Because we've done maybe some man thoughts, man not men like male, but people way to do stuff to get them into this office. And what we've done is we have eliminated or minimized the importance of prayer for those people. And so we're now on the other end trying to solve our problems by going to so many seminars and learning this, learning this, learning this, learning this. And what we really need to do is to go back and pray. And so I'm rebuking myself, really, not you all, because everything rises and falls on leadership. And if I'm one of the leaders and you're kind of looking to me as a point person to some degree, although I've got accountability teams, but we got to pray. When you enter into a relationship with someone, you need to pray. When you want to put on a new missionary, you need to pray. In your business, you need to ask God, who is going to be our hire? I have a form that I hand out to a lot of guys that are out there hiring. It's called 62 Questions to Ask a New Hire as an interview process. I'd say you don't need to ask those questions until you pray. Now, I will give you this. I'm not God. I'm not Jesus Christ. So I don't have the mind and the Lord, he knows and he can pick them out. In a few moments, you're going to see what another part of this is as well. Let's go to number four. He picked him out after much prayer. Then what did he do? He sent them out, and they had a responsibility. And I wanted you to write this down. He sent them out. Now, as you're marking up your notes here a little bit, I'd like you to track with me just a little bit because I want to show you how the, the timeline of working with them happened. All right? He's doing his job. Certain ones are intrigued by Christ. They come to Christ. Others are coming to Christ. He's calling them to him. Through the calling, they're believing in him. While the believing in him is going on, they're now starting to follow him more faithfully. He now tells them to keep on, follow, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. He didn't say that to, to be an apostle. He just said, follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. So now they're leaving their fishing trade, and they're following him. Then he says, I want you to be with me. Mark chapter 3 talks about when he's calling them. He says, now I want you to be with me. And with him is for two purposes. One, to observe what Jesus did. That'll, we'll call that modeling. He was modeling these truths, showing them what to do. And then secondly, he was instructing them. That's another verse. So he was mentoring them. And then so he modeled it and he mentored them. And while that was going on, then he went up and he prayed. And he said, out of all these folks, I'm picking 12. And he picked 12. Now, I didn't say it out, outwardly that he's picking 12, but that's what he did. Once he had those 12, he wanted to do something else. He wanted them to be with them some more. And then he wanted to instruct them some more. Now, I don't have time to teach you the whole life of Christ on apostleship, but he also then let them go out and then brought them back again. Here's what I would say. I would say this was nothing more than a Jesus seminary that was going on, and these were his seminarians. So he brought them in, he taught them, modeled it in front of them, and then he sent them out Saturday, Sunday, maybe Monday, came back to classes on Tuesday and heard what they had to do. Now, that is coming from Scripture. Listen when they return what was going on in their ministry. He did that for approximately three years before he then sent them out. Now, watch. Before he finally unleashes them into the world for the final building of the church, they had to wait until who came? Everybody? The Holy Spirit had to come. And we haven't even got there yet. Maybe in two weeks. All right. That being said, I want you to know that's the whole economy of what's going on. Now, when he was sending them out to preach, what did he want them to do? I'd like you now to leave Luke and go to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. Those of you who are, are new or listening here for the very first time on the radio to this program, I really want you to listen now, put your focus on this, because I'm going to give you what Jesus sent these apostles out to do, but I'm going to park on one part of the message. And I want you to listen and engage in this, because ultimately this is how it all begins for everyone. All right, so listen to that part. I'll let you know when it's coming up. So those of you that are taking notes, what were they to do when he sent them out? They were to preach. It's in your notes. There's a lot of verses that says the apostles went out to preach. They were to teach. We know that he was, they were told to do that. Teach them to obey all things what's there I've commanded. You, you know all this stuff, I'm sure. And then he also taught them to evangelize, which I'll talk about in a moment. But he also sent them out to heal and to cast out demons. 
Now, there's not much else I can find specifically to the foundational apostles. So I would say other things might be subject to this or they would be included in this, but the specific things, they were to preach, teach, evangelize, heal, and cast out demons. That you can take to the bank. Now, that being said, I want you to go to Acts chapter 10. Are you at Acts chapter 10? In a moment, I'm going to read verse 39 through verse 43, but I've got to set you up because some of you are so... You're just getting this now. All right, I've talked about what Jesus did, all right? Got his guys, he starts sending them out. He then goes to the cross, he dies there, rises again from the dead. He gives them some more instructions, 40 days, all right, listen, giving them instructions, showing himself to those guys, at the same time answering some questions, same time upbraiding them, that means lambasting them in love for their unbelief, their lack of faith at times. And then he's reminding them that the Spirit has still yet to come before you go out. And then he leaves. Ten days are happening. And then they're praying. The Spirit comes. The apostles are now sealed deal with adding one, eleven, now twelve. We'll talk about that in a second. And now they're out doing the very thing that they were told to do, what they watched Jesus doing, what they were empowered to do, now they're out doing that. So I wanted you to see that there's a timeline in here. When I get to Acts chapter 8, the Spirit has already come now, and now they're out doing the very thing that He sent them to do. Are you all with me? Are you with me? Okay, please don't fade here, because you're not going to get this other churches. You may get three points in a poem, but this is what you're going to get here. All right, stay with me now. When we're talking about all of this, I want to do a little parenthesis. Some people have the idea that this is a great religious book about Christianity. My, 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 my. And look what happens in the end days. And I think that's quite fascinating. But here's what I want you to know. Listen, look up here. We are in Bible times. You catch that? We are living in Bible times. Why am I saying we're living in Bible times? Because Jesus still has to come back. We still have the tribulation, still have the millennium, still have the new heavens and the earth out there. So that means in a big timeline, we're still living in the Bible times. We're just not living in the Bible days. Do I hear a witness on that? Okay. No, I don't hear a witness. All right. Stay with me now. All right. So now, what were these guys doing to fulfill the command of what the Lord told them to do? Now, you that are guests and visitors, you want to listen now because this is going to give it to you in a nutshell. Verse 39, 1039. Peter, by the way, if you'll notice in verse 34, is speaking all over the place. Peter says, we are witnesses of all these things he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. Not that there's no Jews in Jerusalem, it just means the land of the Jews would be in northern Israel, Galilee. And then it says, they also put him to death by hanging him on a cross. You might say, I thought they nailed him on a cross. Well, you'll nail a picture on the wall, you'll hang a picture on the wall. It's the same basic thing. Verse 40, God raised him on the third day. They knew hanging on the cross meant death. So if God raised him the third day, means he came back to life again. So you have the death and the resurrection. And granted that he would become visible. And we know from 1 Corinthians 15 that there were uh, myriads of people that saw him. Then he says, verse 41, not to all the people that he made himself known, but to witnesses who were chosen beforehand by God. Now that in itself will preach heavy. So look up here for a moment. I won't go long, just listen. While Jesus came back to life, he could have revealed himself to a lot more people than he did, but he handpicked a bunch. Now, we're not talking one, we're not talking ten, we're not talking a hundred. We are talking hundreds that he specifically revealed himself to. Apostles for sure, which is in context, but there were others that saw him, which means that that validated that he died. It validated that he rose again from the dead because he was alive, because he visibly shown himself after death that he was who he claimed to be. Let's go back to the passage. Now, verse 41 again. Not to all the people, but to witnesses who were chosen beforehand, that is, to us apostles, who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. Now you've got it, death and resurrection. Verse 42. And he ordered us, the apostles to start with, to preach to the people, herald something, make something known, and solemnly, that means seriously, to testify that this is the one, referring to Christ, who has been appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. In other words, not only did he do all of this, but you're going to have to give an account of what you do with what you know. Now, verse 43 is the key. This is where you want to come. This is where it all begins for us as a Christian. Of whom, of Christ, all the prophets bear witness. And that would be Jeremiah, Isaiah, Daniel, all the Old Testament prophets bear witness that through his name, Jehovah Yasha, God who saves, everyone, underline that, 
Everyone, and I could say anyone. So this grace is provided for everyone who believes in him. There's your faith alone in Christ alone. It doesn't say who behaves. It doesn't say believe and behave. It says whoever believes in him. It doesn't say who gets baptized, keeps the commandments, or turns from sin. I'll let that sink in for a moment. Because a lost person really can't turn from sin because that's a righteous deed. And a righteous deed he can't do because we're dead in trespasses and sins. So God doesn't look at our deeds. Who believes in him, he looks at our heart. And then it says, everyone, anyone who believes in him receives what? Forgiveness of sins. Now, that was the message that began to launch out into the church. And that's how they were selected. They had to believe, they were called, they were chosen, and they had to be sent out with a message. I can see right now that I am not going to have time to finish this. <clears throat> But I think I better go. I better end with this last part. <clears throat> Many people today that that follow religions and they get comparative religions and they like to be really religious. They go to churches that have a lot of stained glass windows. They have a lot of the pomp and circumstance that goes with religiosity. And sometimes that religiosity has a lot of what we might call so-called Christianity and stuff. And I don't ever want to put that down. But at the same time, I don't want that to be our template of what we really think Scripture is teaching because it's really not. I would be the last person to look at these 12 or 11 guys and think any less of those apostles for what they've done. For my faith, my life, my ministry, my everything is upon Jesus Christ who's the foundation. And from him, that was made known to the world by the apostles as they then continued this process of world globalization and the gospel. So I won't put them down. But at the same time, I want you to know that the Lord never once picked them because of anything special in themselves. It was underneath the sovereign act of God. The closest I can get to try to maybe understand God and why he would choose, choose these guys would be for us to see that God is willing to use anyone. For example, out of the 12 that he chose... The last one, Judas Iscariot, was a rummy. He's the only one we don't believe was from an area of northern Israel called Galilee. Galilee was like the worst part of our island to live on, we might say. All right. When you looked at the guys that he chose, you need to know a little bit more. Matthew, and then you have Simon the Zealot. Big deal. Everybody knows that Matthew was a tax collector. Some people know that Simon was a zealot. What in the world does that all mean? What that means is Matthew was a Jew, but basically he worked for the government, the Roman government, to overtax and do some things to get more money out of the Jews so he could have more money and perhaps maybe get in more good with the Romans. So he was kind of like a traitor to his own people. Then you have Simon the Zealot. He was so zealous for the Jews that often those zealots were a part of another organization of terrorists who would have daggers under their robes that would go along and kill anybody who was a Roman who did anything to, to hurt or harm Jews. So now you have this terrorist and you have Matthew, the very two guys that are working opposite each other, and there they are in the same team of apostles. And then mixed in all of this, you have little simple Peter, James, and John. What were they? Nothing more than fishermen that are trying to eke out a living on the Sea of Galilee. They really weren't into this big Roman fight or this big pro-Jew fight. It was just, we just want to survive. And all of them are together. I don't, so what's that telling me? It doesn't matter your political background. It doesn't matter your educational background. It doesn't matter your connections. It doesn't matter your employment. All that matters is, is God sovereignly wants to choose us. And then once he chooses, watch this now, through the power of the Holy Spirit and our re submission to his word and his spirit, God begins to change us and use us. Now, he doesn't make us all exactly walk in lockstep with one another, but he does take where we are and we become more like Christ, and that's the whole part of the body. So let's give you these quickly and we'll close. They're not stained glass saints. They're just ordinary men. They lacked understanding. Jesus kept saying, don't you get this? They lacked humility. A couple of the guys wanted to know from Jesus if they could sit on his right hand and left hand when they finally got to heaven. They lacked faith. How many times did Jesus say, oh, ye of little faith? They lacked commitment, especially the night before Jesus was finally betrayed. And then they even lacked their commitment when he was on the cross. They fled. They lacked power. They kept stumbling and falling until the Holy Spirit came. And then what's so interesting, once the Holy Spirit came, they got greater understanding. They were humble. They were great men of faith. They were committed even unto death. And that when people looked at them, they scratched their head. And all they could say is, you must have been with Jesus. 
And that's what the Holy Spirit did. So what does that do for us, folks? You know what that tells me? There's hope for all of us. Amen? That God would do that. You know what else that tells me? If he did that with the apostles and they, watch this, watch this, they were so important that they would be called the foundation of the church in a sense. And all of us are on that and on Christ. God can do something with you and me. There are so many lessons in here. I can spend an hour just spending just 15 different applications. I'm going to let the Holy Spirit do it. The bigger take-home points is what I've given you in your notes. They're real simple. I like them. They, they work for me. Our history is as long and strong. As Christians, aren't they? We have a long history as Christians, and it's very strong. We withstood all the different persecutions, and we will continue to do so. Nobody can kill Christianity. It will never be extinguished. Why? Because it's prevalent and it's powerful. But also our heritage as Christians is sound. It is built upon the inerrant and sufficient word of God. It is sound. And at the same time, it abounds. It's not to be just studied in some little small group so that it's us four, no more, shut the door. Look at how much I know and you don't know and I know more than you know. It's all about getting dirty for God with what we know by reaching out to others. Therefore, I'm going to appreciate the history of the church. Now, give me a moment on this. We have the most unusual music at our church because we're kind of like all over the map. And uh, we'll sing traditional hymns sometimes. We'll do Hawaiian music sometimes. We will sing praise songs. Sometimes we get a little upbeat. We'll sing all different kinds of songs here. And people wonder, are you trying to find yourself? No, I don't think we have traditional or I don't think we have contemporary. I just think we have biblical. You know, just just be as biblical as you can be. I said all that to say, that's why we won't move away from some of the old hymns. And maybe there's even more sacred hymns that we don't sing or we don't do any longer. And you say, why should we do that? Because, watch this, we sing the contemporary to try to uh, appeal to the unchurched people and their style of music. And I understand that we should be all things to all people that by all means we might save some. I understand all that. I'm there. Okay. But at the same time, I think they and all of us need to remember that we are built upon a tremendous tradition of sound history and heritage that got us to where we are today. And we can't totally reject it. Y'all like that. Let me say this too. On the other hand, there are some people that are so involved in Reformed theology and all they want to talk about is Reformed theology and the Puritans that keep going back to Calvin, back to Calvin, and I'm not going to dismiss his teaching. He's a great man of God. I've got, I have personally, I have the first edition translated into English copies of his commentaries. I have that whole set locked up in an airtight room. That being said, some of them, they've never gone any further. It's like God died when Calvin died. You understand what I'm saying? I have a smile on my face. I love you. I'm hugging you. Okay. But you can't do that either. It's a movement. And so we don't leave it and we move on. What we do is we embrace it and we grow. There's more technicolor. There's more strength. It's developing us as God is moving us. So our heritage is sound and abound. It's been properly planted. And I think that's why it is here today. And the beautiful part of it, it's producing fruit. So my question to you is, you guests that are here, would you be one of his fruit today? Will you trust Christ as your Savior by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone? I pray so. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes and give you a moment to really reflect. Today, there was a lot on your plate. Wonderful music, dramatic testimony. And those of you who are guests, you came in and thought, oh, look at this nice little coffee and punch, and this ought to be a quick little service. And you got in here and you're saying, whew, this is really heavy. I'd appreciate if you wouldn't move around in our sanctuary right now if possible because we've got some people that need to really concentrate. I don't want them to be distracted. Thank you so much for them. All right. um, So for some of you, it'd be an opportunity for you to really get alone with the Lord in your mind. The Lord sovereignly brought you here today. In some measure, you came here and God provided a way for you to get here. Something got you here. It wasn't by accident. There's a bigger thing going on, supernatural, maybe mystical, I don't know. But I know this, that we have a sovereign God. And he wanted you to hear this today so that your faith will not be based upon what a little church in New Guanu might believe. It's built upon the integrity of the theology of Scripture that is provably accurate 
and sufficient and has been defended by men, women, and some children even until death. They believe it. And what is that message? That there is one who died and rose again. That did that for you so that anyone who would believe in him, Christ, would have the forgiveness of sins. And so all you need to do is to embrace that. You need to believe Christ, first, that he is who he is, and that what he said is truth. You need to believe him. That is true. He is Christ. He did die. He rose again. Believe him. Now you need to believe in him. I mean, you need to take that truth into your heart and place your eternal destiny in that truth in Christ. And on the authority of his word, based on what you just heard, you will have the forgiveness of sins, past, present, future, big sins, little sins, religious sins, worldly sins, whatever sin. And the greatest sin of all is the sin of unbelief. That will be forgiven you because you've placed your faith in Christ. Now, I'd like to pray for you. And when I pray for you, it's not praying you into heaven. It's not making you stand up, come down an aisle, fill out a card, do anything like that. It's just you letting me know silently but with an uplifted hand that today was the day that you trusted Christ as Savior. And you'd like for me to pray for you. You won't say anything. No one's looking around. No one's going to come to your chair. I'm just going to pray for you in a general fashion. Do you need to raise your hand and me pray for you to get into heaven? Nope. You can sit right there all by yourself and just talk to the Lord. Can you make a mistake? Not really. If you truly are trusting in Christ alone, you can't. He knows your heart. He wants you in his forever family. He's not going to make it hard. It's not hard believism. It's just believing. It's just trusting. It's just relying on. It's by faith in the right object, Christ. So with heads bowed and eyes closed, is there anyone in here today by an uplifted hand that would like me to pray for them? Because today was the day you're trusting Christ. Would you slip up your hand? Anyone at all? Thank you. God bless you. Anyone else? Thank you. You may put your hand down. For the rest of you, let the Spirit of God awash you on these truths. We're part of the community of the redeemed, of a rich heritage. Ten years from now, people are going to look on us as part of that heritage as well. What have we done with our Christianity today for them for tomorrow? Are we a part of the community of the redeemed that we will be there for one another when they have a need, when we can? We'll be there for one another to model the word and mentor them in the word. Are we going to be there for those who don't know Christ? Because these apostles were sent out to evangelize, to reach out to others, and maybe even plant churches. What would the Lord have us do? Let the Lord speak to you. We all can take a baby step forward in what we should be doing. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we've really had a wonderful plate. We had a buffet here today. The only difference is, is the folks didn't get a chance to pick and choose what they wanted on their plate. So it was just piled high. And maybe, Father, they couldn't eat all of it. It was just so much. But I'm thankful that it was quality food. Maybe not delivered so well, but the food was good. And so, Father, help them all to take a bite of that food. For some, it'll be a, a sip or a gulp of milk. For others, it's going to be a nibble or a mouthful of meat. Let us all go to that truth. And then, Father, change us from the inside out. I thank you for this one that indicated by an uplifted hand they were trusting you as Savior. I pray that they talk to you in prayer and not these little, now I lay me down to sleep speeches. I, I pray that, Father, that they would meet together regularly at church, the tradition of the church the family of the church built upon qualified apostles and the foundation being none other than the person in the work of Jesus Christ. I pray that they would study your word and read that it's not a book to take away their fun, that, Father, it's a book to enhance their life and to get them to know you. It's a love letter, Father. I pray that they'd tell someone else that they became a believer today. They just have to 
kind of run to the next person and say, you'll never know what happened to me. It's so exciting. My sins are forgiven and I'm heading to heaven. Father, thank you for that. Father, I pray this all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. This is Joe Pons, and I want to thank you for listening to Make It Clear with the teaching of Dr. Stan Pons, founder of Make It Clear Ministries and president of Clarity Christian College. Make It Clear is dedicated to taking the word of God with clarity into every person's world. It's the support of listeners like you who make the ministry of Make It Clear possible. You can provide your tax-deductible gift to Make It Clear online by going to makeitclear.org. That's makeitclear.org. Thank you for helping us make it clear. If you would like to have Dr. Pond speak at your church or event, please email us at tellmemore at makeitclear.org. That's tellmemore at makeitclear.org. Thank you, and remember to make it clear.